and look at the life of Abraham. And we're in that first book, the book of the beginnings uh, in the Bible, Genesis chapter 22. And uh, with God's help this morning, we're to be talking about faith, faith that God will provide, faith that God will provide. And, uh, and so let's go ahead and read uh, that Genesis 22. We're going to read the first two verses uh, there, but we're going to be looking through a lot of the verses as we go through uh, verse by verse this chapter. But if you look with me first at Genesis 22, uh, verse 1 through 2, and it tells us this, And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Do you have faith in God? Do you have trust in God? Do you have complete trust in God. You know, I'm not asking if you're a religious person or if you pray a lot or if you attend church or if you serve, or if you give away lots of money or something like that. No, I'm asking, do you really trust God? Oftentimes myself, all of us, we can make excuses for a lack of faith, a lack of trust in God. Maybe we can even boast about it, about the faith or trust we have in God. But sometimes Christians, they, they are accused of being fair weather Christians, which means when our circumstances are good, then, man, we are really trusting, we're really praising, we're really worshiping God. But when those circumstances are not, when they're being tested, then our faith, our, 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 it does not seem to be as strong. Are you okay with tests? Are you okay with examinations? Are you okay with your faith uh, being tested? You know, I taught secondary school uh, for several years, and uh, I know there's several people in here, I mean, you're, you're in secondary school, some of you are in university getting advanced degrees, and you know very well about exams and tests and quizzes and pop quizzes and all those things, and uh, I think all of us mostly could agree, and if not, then you're, you're just crazy, okay? You don't like tests. I don't like tests, and when I would prepare a test for my students, you know, I would put uh, short answers, I'd put multiple choice, A, B, C, uh, and people love those. Uh, I put the essay questions at the very end. People hated those. I don't know why, but they just hated those. And I did that because I wanted to make sure they were prepared. I wanted to make sure that they were ready for what was next. And it's often been said that a faith that cannot be tested, it can't be trusted. And we see Abraham's faith definitely being examined, definitely being tested here. And there's really only one other time in the Bible where someone demonstrates such a high level of trust in the will of God. And that was Jesus on the same hill on Moriah, on Mount Calvary, where Jesus, right before he tells God the Father, thy will be done. Where Jesus demonstrates that high level of trust as he goes to that cross to be sacrificed for us. And so what we're seeing here as Jesus was born to die, God gives us an amazing preview to Jesus' death, and not only his death, but also his resurrection, all the way at the beginning of the Bible here, all the way in Genesis. And so this morning, with God's help, we're going to look at some details in this story that's going to teach us how, that despite of our changing circumstances of our life, despite of the ups and downs, how we can have complete faith, how we can have trust in God. So let's go ahead and pray. We're asking God to just help us apply these truths, uh, and we will jump in here. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful just how you have drawn us to yourself. Lord, there's, there's several people in here where we can give, uh, we can tell a story of how uh, we were confused, uh, we were broken, and we didn't know where to turn, and we turned to you, and Lord, you, you made us a new person. Lord, you, you gave us yourself, and um, Lord, we're so thankful for that. God, I'm thankful how you just brought Drew people here this morning as people had to set alarms and uh, people had to uh, get children ready and, and do all sorts of things just to be able to be here this morning with hearts of worship, hearts to, to know you. And so, Lord, we're just thankful for how your Holy Spirit does that. 
But Lord, as we come to this important part of our time together, as we're seeing your very words to us, uh, Lord, I pray that you help me to get out of the way. I pray that you would help our uh, us to truly understand the ways that you provide, the, the what faith, what trust in you is. Lord, help us to see Jesus today all the way in Genesis 22. And Lord, we will be faithful to give you the praise and the glory. Lord, I pray for the unspoken spiritual needs that people might have this morning. Lord, I pray you administer to them in your special way. God, we say all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I want you to notice first as we look at these first couple of verses that God had a comprehensive exam for Abraham. You know, in verse 1, it says, and it came to pass after these things. What things? Lots of things. There's been lots of peculiar tests that have been in, a, in Abraham's life, several of them. You know, because for us to grow in our faith, we need to be tested uh, in ways that challenge our comfort zones, that w in ways that challenge uh, things that are in our control, and, and in ways that may seem peculiar to many people. And the first time that we see God testing Abraham is all the way in Genesis chapter 12. Uh, God tells Abraham, he said, Abraham, I want you to leave your country. I want you to leave your family. Pretty much, I want you to leave everything that you know. And maybe some of us in this room, you know a little bit about that kind of faith. And he said, I want you to go somewhere. And Abraham like, well, where? Well, I'm not going to tell you where. I just want you to go, and eventually I'll tell you to stop. I'll tell you when you get there where you're at. And so Abraham, he takes that big step of faith and he leaves the land, his family, everything he knew. But then in Genesis 13, Abraham, he still has uh, with his wife, he, he still has another close family member with him, Lot, his nephew whom he loves. And Lot and Abraham, man, they're, 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 they're uh, shepherds are fighting like cats and dogs. They want the same land. And God leads Abraham to go over here. But Lot decides to go to Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham has to leave and separate himself from a nephew, his one last family member he has uh, back from Ur. And then we see in Genesis 17, Abraham and Sarah, they, they, they laugh at God. God reminds them of a promise he made to them that Sarah was going to have a son. And that not only he wasn't just going to be any son, but he was going to be the son of promise that one day from that son, that there was going to be someone that would come that wouldn't just bless a few people, he would be able to bless everybody in the world one day. And he gives that promise to Abram and Sarah. But Abram and Sarah, you see, they had already gotten ahead of God. They already had, had a plan. They already had another son, Ishmael, that, uh, that, that they had with Hagar. And uh, Ishmael, they wanted, Abraham says, God, I want, I want Ishmael to be the guy. I want him to be, I, don't worry about nine-year-old Sarah having a baby. No, what about Ishmael? And God says, no, Abraham, he's not the son of promise. He's not the what, the what he's a result of your own scheming. He's a result of you trying to manipulate things. He's a result of you trying to control things. He's a result of you trying to operate outside of God's will. He, he's your dream. He's your plan. And so God wanted Abraham and Sarah to really trust in God. So Abraham has to trust God for Isaac. Chapter 21, we see that God does the impossible. He gives geriatric Sarah. He gives her Isaac. He keeps his promise. So we see these several peculiar tests, but I want you to notice now in verse 2, it's a puzzling test now where he says, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest. Ishmael and, uh, has already left, so Isaac's the only one in the home now. If you were Abraham, wouldn't this request seem puzzling to you? I mean, do, do you remember what Abraham's name used to be? If you were to meet Abraham, you're like, Oh, what's your Abram? Oh, what does your name mean? Um, well, my name means exalted father. Oh, oh, how many children do you have? I don't have any. Oh, okay, okay. Well, then you meet, maybe you meet Abram later on. You travel, you meet him at some other truck stop somewhere else. And, oh, what's your, oh, you're Abram. No, 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 my name's Abraham now. Oh, Abraham. Oh, oh, what does that, what, what does your name mean? Oh, uh, my, my name means uh, father of a multitude, father of nations. Oh, how many children do you have? Well, one left, and then one I'm about to sacrifice in three days. Doesn't seem like things are going well for Abraham here. Seems puzzling that God would ask him to do this. 
When Abraham laughed at God after he heard that aging Sarah would indeed have a son, what did God say to Abraham? What did God ask Abraham? He said, is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for me? Isaac is supposed to be the result of God's promise. What is he going to tell Sarah? That's what I would be worried about as a husband. What am I going to tell my wife what God just told me? What am I going to tell my son? How am I going to explain this to him? If God takes Isaac, then what? How can God make me sacrifice something that I love? How can God make me sacrifice the impossible miracle that he gave me? And so this is very puzzling, I'm sure, but we know that God tells us that my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. And perhaps he trusted that every word of God is pure, Proverbs tells us. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Friends, God is not going to test your trust by asking you to give up something that you hate, that you despise. It very well may be asking you to give up something that you love. God is not going to ask me, he's not going to test my faith by asking me never to have a pet cat. I hate cats. I hate them. You know, cat, cats, I think, if, if a Satan didn't use the snake in the Garden of Eden, the cat would have been the second choice. Cats are evil. I don't like them. You know, God, God is not going to probably test most of you by saying, you know what? Uh, you know, in the U.S., uh, fasting, I, like, I, I hear some believers here, when they fast, they really fast. But in the U.S., we're like, oh, well, fat, I will not eat my donut. I'm not going to eat donuts this week. That's the fast. You know, it's like, oh, I'm really sacrificed. I'm fasting. I'm not going to eat my donut. Or I'm not going to eat my, uh, my I'm not going to go to the buffet. All you can eat buffet this You know, that's the fast. You know, God's not going to test my faith by asking me not to eat kale salad. You know, but I'm okay with that. But he might test our faith by asking us to do something that might seem puzzling. He may want us to do something the average person thinks is kind of peculiar. So we see this as a puzzling test for Abraham. But we also see, though, that this is a prepared test. It's prophetic. You know, Genesis 22, it's not just a story that stands on its own. It's a beautiful story. It's part of God's plan to rescue mankind. Through the ages. And this is, in Genesis 22, this is just a preview. This is just a snapshot of a future event that's going to happen in the same location. Uh, when someone comes to Jesus, you know, we, we can't help but see the cross. We can't help but notice the cross. And this is prophecy. We get to see God, the Father's heart of love uh, for his son. You know, when someone comes to Jesus, we can't, we have to realize he's not just a prophet. He's not just a good man. No, he is God. He is God's son. He is God in the flesh. And we can't separate Jesus from what he did on the cross for you and for I. Jesus, he came and he, he suffered for us. And we must come to him realizing that we are broken, that we are a sinner, that without we don't have hope in ourselves. We are separated from God. We are bound for eternal separation from God in a place called hell. But when we look at Jesus, when we consider the cross, you see a Savior that loves you and I with an everlasting love. Someone, he proves that by dying for us. And through Jesus' death, there's an opportunity for you and for I to be, to be rescued, to be repaired, to be restored, to be redeemed, to be reborn, to be renewed. And so God tells Abraham here, this is a prepared test. He said, take now thy son, thine only son, whom thou lovest. And it's a preview of God's words when he says, Jesus, when he was baptized, he went up straightway out of the water. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son and whom I'm well pleased. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We know that he says, he that spared not his own son, but he delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things. Oftentimes, friends, what you see is that in the spiritual realm is God may subtract something from your life so he can multiply blessings in your life. 
We see that over and over again in scripture. We see that over and over again. Maybe you can even look back to a time in your life where that has happened for you. You know, when I gave a test uh, to my students, I would walk around uh, as they were taking their exam and, uh, you know, make sure they weren't cheating, you know, stuff. So I'd walk between the rows. And uh, most, a lot of the tests and quizzes and exams that were given, they were prepared already, like they were by, by like a publishing house. So you just rip it out of the book and you would hand it to them. But th this one, the ones I, I usually would do is I would write myself. And sometimes they didn't know that. So they would raise their hand and uh, I would come up and I'm like, yes. And they said, we didn't go over this. We didn't go over this material. Like, do you know this question's on here? That, this question, did you know that's, yeah, I know that question's on. I wrote, I put it on there. And, and then I would walk in and they're like, oh, that, that's, that's wrong right there or whatever. Or, or that even when we would grade, I'd say, this is the, no, that's not the answer. No, 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 this, this is the answer. I mean, no, 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 I know, I know the answer. I, I have the answer key. And what they sometimes didn't realize is that was a prepared test. I had written it. Uh, I had studied it. We had gone, you missed, you missed class last week. That's why you didn't know it was on the test. And what you see here, what's happening with Abraham, what we see happens with Jesus is it was, it was prepared. You see a father here making detailed preparations to sacrifice his son that he loves Dearly, And later in Exodus, the Jews, what would they do as they celebrated the Passover? Uh, they would set aside a lamb, a Passover lamb, four days before the sacrifice. They made a lot of preparations before that. And now Abraham, he has to go on a three-day journey. He has to make lots of preparations in order to sacrifice his son. And friends, when Jesus was betrayed, when Jesus was uh, scourged, when he was beaten with, with that cut of nine tails, when he was crucified on the cross, it was not just some arbitrary decision of Pilate. It was not just some arbitrary decision of the Pharisees and of the religious rulers and of the Jews and, yeah, even the Gentiles. No, it wasn't just a decision that they were making because they despised and hated Jesus. No, God tells us in Acts 2, 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. They were only doing what had already been determined to be done by God the Father. First Peter uh, tells us, as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who barely was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So God knew this was planned. God knew what was happening here. It was planned. It was prophetic. And why? Why? Why would God ask Abraham to do this? Why would God planned before time even began, before creation even creation was, was started. Why would God already have a plan for his son to die on the cross for mankind whom he loves? Well, we know that God tells in Isaiah 53 that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes, we are healed. All we like sheep, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord have laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. He was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He has brought as a lamb to the slaughter as a sheep before her shears is dumb. He opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generation? He was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. That's why. So we see this comprehensive examination for Abraham here. But I want you to notice, secondly this morning as we look at verse 3 the confident expectation of Abraham, the hope that Abraham held. And it's marked by his swift obedience. If you look at verse 3 with me, it says, And Abraham, he rose up early in the morning. He saddled his ass. He took two of his young men with him, and Isaac and his son, and clave uh, the wood for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Abraham rose up early in the morning. He didn't uh, delay. He didn't press the snooze button again and again and again. 
He didn't make any excuses. He didn't ask God lots of follow-up questions. He, he didn't try to wiggle out of it. He didn't try to manipulate God. Do you put off trusting in God? Do you try to find excuses not to trust in him? Perhaps you say, you know, I'll trust in God, but first I have to do this. I'll have faith in God, but first let me take care of this, and then I'll take that step. Uh, you know, first, in order for me to really trust God, God needs to do this for me first. He does for me, then I will do for him. Uh, these circumstances need to be perfectly right in order for me to trust him. And friends, simply put, if we are not willing to swiftly obey clear commands in Scripture from God, it's a reflection of, of my weak, weak trust in him. It's a reflection of our weak trust in him. Jesus told us in John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. He says, you are my friend if you do whatsoever I have commanded you. So we see this confident expectation of Abraham. We see that he, he, he responds with swift obedience. But then I want you to notice his steadfast obedience. Look at verses 3 through 10 with me. And Abraham rose up early, and we already read that. But let's jump to for, uh, verse 4. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes. He saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Hmm. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. He laid it upon Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to a place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. Can you imagine how agonizing this process was? The burden that Abraham carried was not just the knife, was not just the torch of fire. It was not just a bunch of wood that he chopped up. No, it was this emotional, it was this spiritual burden that he's carrying for three days. For three days as they, they journey to this mountain, he keeps his conversation with God to himself. He's steadfast. I wonder if Abraham had second thoughts. Abraham had found his way out of uh, having faith in God before, but this time we don't see that. This time Abraham's not trying to manipulate the situation. He's not trying to change the circumstances. He's swiftly obeying. He's steadfastly obeying. In verse 6, he has the wood, he has the fire, he has the knife, but Isaac asks, Dad, what about the lamb? Abraham knows Isaac is the lamb. But yet he continues to have faith in God. In verse 9, he gets to the mountain, he builds an altar, he puts the wood on there, he binds up his son, he carries his son, he puts him on the altar, he gets the knife. Every step of the way, he could have bowed out. He could have given up. He could have changed his mind. But he had confident expectation in God. He had hope in God. He had faith and trust in God. Friends, the victorious Christian life is not lived in one momentary decision. Your Christian life is not just one decision you make, and then after that it's all gumdrops, rainbows, and unicorns. No, the Christian life is through obedience. It's lived out through steadfast, faith-filled consistency. It's steadfast. And friend, do you exercise faith in God through obedience? And this is a question I'm asking myself as well. Or do we demonstrate a weak faith through our inaction, which is really disobedience? Abraham, like I said, he could have gone back many times over these several days. Why didn't he? Why didn't Abraham do that? I want you to look at Romans 4 up here. Romans 4, it tells us what was going on in Abraham's mind. It says, who against hope, he believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken. 
so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that he had promised he was also able to perform. God said Isaac was going to be the one. He was the promised son. He told him Isaac was where one day Jesus would come from that line. So he has steadfast obedience. And friends, the reason why he's able to be swift and steadfast is because he was sure. He was sure. Verse 5, look at verse 5 again with me in Genesis 22. He says, I am the lad. He says, we're going to come again to you. We're going to go up. We're going to worship. But I am the lad. We're going to come again to you. That's what he tells these, these men. And friends, he was strong in his faith. He was strong in his his a confident expectation because of who he knew God to be. God is not a man that he should lie. Neither is he the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said and shall he not do it? Or hath he not spoken and shall he not make it good? And he knew who God was. He knew that God hadn't lied to him. He knew that God kept his promises. God promised Abraham an impossible thing. He promised Sarah an impossible thing. A, a son, he did it. They laughed, but God did it because nothing is too hard for him. And Abraham knew that if Isaac would, to die, would die on Mount Moriah, that he was going to witness another impossible miracle. He was going to witness Isaac resurrecting from the dead. He told those lads at the bottom of the mountain, hey, we're going to go worship. We'll be back in uh, uh, two wee seconds. Most of the time when people say that, it's a bold-faced lie, isn't it? It's not two seconds. They're not we, they're not two, and they're not seconds, you know. So was Abraham lying to them? He's like, he's going to come back down and say, oh, Isaac bopped his head. You know, he died, like, he's going to cover, you know, that's his cover story. Is he lying to them? Or did he really believe that Isaac was going to rise again from the dead? Hebrews 11 tells us this about Abraham. This is how we know he wasn't lying. This is how we know he believed that Isaac would rise again from the dead. He said, by faith, Abraham, when he was tried, he offered up Isaac. And he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that an Isaac shall thy seed be called, accounting that God is able to raise him up, even from the dead. For whence also he, that's referring to Abraham, received him, that's referring to Jesus, in a figure. Friends, he believed without a doubt, he was sure that God was going to keep his promise to him. And friends, when life doesn't make sense to you, you need to turn to Scripture. When life doesn't make sense to you, you need to listen to the Spirit of God. When life doesn't make sense to you, uh, you need to look to the Savior. You need to have faith in who God is and what he has said because his words, they are for already forever settled in heaven. Uh, Ezekiel says it this way, I, the Lord, have spoken it. It shall come to pass. I will do it. I will not go back. Abraham knew God. And he was sure that God was going to keep his promise. He was confident in it. Thank you, many of you, uh, for your condolences. Uh, you know, uh, when, when uh, Bethany's grandmother, she went to heaven. She was 90 years old. And uh, several of you uh, uh, were just very sweet and let us know you're praying in different things. So Bethany went back. I had the girls... And uh, I was trying to find things to do to keep them occupied. And so I took them to St. Columns Park, and I got to see the vast difference between my two daughters. One trusts me, the other one doesn't. And, uh, and Melanie, you know, I would try to put her, the youngest one, I'd try to get her to set my lap on the swing, and she would scream. She was sure that I was going to drop her. You know, I would try to get her to go on the big slide. I would hold her. No, 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 she's not going to do it. I try to put her on the obstacles, I'm the spinny things, all the different things. She's not going to do it. Macy would like jump from a skyscraper and let me catch her if I coaxed her enough. If I said, oh, I'll give you a jelly bean. Okay. You know, and, you know, Macy would just do wild things. And she really trusted that her dad was going to keep her safe, was going to hold on to her as she did some of the older kid things at that playground because she knows me. 
she knows and she said, no, my daddy's not going to let me get hurt. My daddy's going to protect me. And she trusted me. And this is Abraham's relationship with his father, with God. He looks, what's amazing to me is what he's about to do. What does he tell those men at the bottom of that mountain? He says, hey, me and Isaac, we're going to go worship. He's looking at the worst time in his life is a time where he's going to worship. He's looking at perhaps the most painful time in his life as a time where he's going to praise God. And friends, worship and praise. I love worshiping God. I love praising God and song. We're going to do a little choir practice at the end uh, at one, uh, and we're going to try to get ready for uh, Easter. We're going to sing forever. Uh, you know, he is risen. And I love singing, but friends, sometimes as Christians, we can think that worship and praise is just singing. It's not. Sometimes your most worshipful times in your life are going to take place in the worst moments of your life. Sometimes the most painful times in your life are the times where you're really going to be able to give the most genuine praise to God. And so Abraham, he goes as he, he perhaps he believes in the principle that all things work together for the, God, for, for the good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. So we see this morning this, this uh, confident expectation of Abraham, this comprehensive example. I want you to see lastly, we're going to end with comfort, a comforting ending. And friends, you may be faced with some impossible exams in your life. Maybe they're real exams. You're like, yes, in universe, man, they're coming. You might be faced with some testings in your life that seem very difficult. But friends, when you respond with a confident expectation and, and God, a hope in God, when you're swift and you're steadfast in your faith and in your trust in him, when you are sure of his precious promises, you will enjoy what many believers all throughout the centuries have enjoyed. You will see and experience that God will provide. I want you to look with me now at verses 11 through 14. And it says, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, and he offered him up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Jehovah-Jireh, we know, you interpret that as God will provide. Friends, this provision in Abraham's life, it is a preview of God's ultimate promise to him. That God will provide one day. Not only God's going to provide Isaac, but one day all the nations of the world, all people of the world will be blessed from what comes from this faith. Lamentations tells us, Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, saith my soul. Therefore will I hope in him. The Lord is good unto them that wait for him, to the soul that seeketh him. And friends, what I want you to notice here in this comforting ending to this story is that God has a time and a place for your provision. Many times we want to choose the location. We want to choose the length of time. And we're saying, usually the location is here. Use the length of time is now. And we're saying, okay, God, provide now. God, I want my faith to become sight right now. I want to see the end of this thing right now. And what you see is that what's interesting that Abraham, he doesn't call God Jehovah Jireh. He has a time and place for his provision. God doesn't call God Jehovah Jireh. He calls a location Jehovah Jireh. He says this location is where God provided. This location of Moriah, God will provide. And friends, what I want to challenge you this morning is let God choose the location of his provision in your life. Let God choose the length of time for his provision for your life. God is not limited by a location. You might say, no, 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 this is not the place. No, no, this is not the time. No, let God choose, and God will provide. 
God has a time and a place, but God has a pure gift for yours and mine provision. I want you to look at verse 7 again. Isaac asks, where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham says, uh, my son, God's going to provide himself a lamb. God will provide a lamb. In other words, he's saying it was provided for himself. The lamb is provided by God, but it was also provided for God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 tells us, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that that we might be made the righteousness, be right with God uh, in him, in Jesus. Friends, only God himself could provide a sacrifice that would that would satisfy, that would atone for his own standard of sin, his own judgment of sin. You and I cannot provide that sacrifice. You and I, we are Isaac. You and I, uh, we, 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 we're bound. Uh, we, we're, we're on that altar and, and we are not good enough. And many times, many people, religion has fooled so many people. Rel- man-made religion has tricked so many people and many people, they'll They'll be running around busy going to all kinds of uh, religious sites and religious uh, pilgrimages all around the world. Uh, some people, they, they say, man, I, I just need to be baptized. I just need to be very moral. I need to check off this good moral check sheet. I need to give lots of money to a church. I, I need to give, uh, give a lot of money to poor people. And I, some people say, oh, I, 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 you can be crucified. You, you, you can become a church member. You can be a very moral, good person. But friends, You can follow after philosophy and religion, all these different things, but it's not going to satisfy God's wrath and judgment and our very real sin. Because the only one who can do that is Jesus Christ. Only God could provide a sacrifice that would satisfy. He says God himself, for himself, is going to provide this lamb. Friends, Neither is our salvation any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus, what he did on the cross for you and for I. And what God is inviting us to do this morning, he wants us to trust in Christ. He alone can be the sacrifice to satisfy God and pay for yours and for mine. So that, that, that great act of love, that that uh, reckless love, that redeeming love when he died on the cross for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him not go, goes to church a lot and tries to do moral things. No, whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And friends, I want to challenge those of you today who would say, Josh, I know I am a believer in Jesus Christ. I am a Christian. I I know I'm on my way to heaven. I know God. Friend, if that is you, I'm asking this to myself this morning as well. If you can trust God to provide a sacrifice that would please himself, such as Jesus Christ, why can't you trust him to help you with everything else? You and I, we can trust God perhaps to give us eternal life But somehow God is not strong enough. God is not able enough to help us with an addiction. We can trust God to give us eternal life, but somehow he's not strong enough. He's not able enough to help us take a step of obedience like baptism, to help us be uh, uh, share Jesus with others, to witness for him. Uh, You know, we trust him for eternal life, but God, I don't want to study the Bible. You know, I... I can't do that. I can't pray. I can't do those things. Friends, if we can trust God with our eternal life, we can trust God with our our marriage, with our children, with our families, with our jobs, with our finances. We can trust God with everything. Friends, I want to encourage you this morning that Christ, he wants you to trust him in every circumstance. He knows about what you're facing in your marriage. He knows about what you're facing with your kids. He knows what you're facing with with visas and legal stuff. He knows what you're facing in the different areas of your life. He knows what you're facing and struggling to obey him and struggling with sin. He understands that. And and you can trust that God says, I will provide. So this morning, I just want to, again, remind those, maybe you're here, maybe someone's watching 
and you'd say, Josh, you know, I'm not sure about this Christian stuff, this Jesus stuff. You know, you, you talk about knowing that you're going to heaven. I, I don't know that. Well, friend, you and I, what we represent in this story is we represent Isaac. And just like Isaac, all of us have sinned. The Bible says we've all come short of the glory of God. And the payment, the wages of sin, it is death. It's separation from God on this earth, but then later eternal separation from God in hell. But the gift of God, what we celebrate Easter, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so many people, so many good-meaning people, they'll say, no, you know, the What we'll do is I'm going to be very moral. I'm going to do a lot of good things, and that's going to outweigh my bad one day. But God tells us, for by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. And friends, very simply, if you want to believe in Christ, if you want to know that you have an eternal home and heaven, a forever relationship with God on this earth through Jesus, the Bible is very clear and very simple. It says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, shall be saved. For at the heart, you believe it in your heart, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Friends, if you want to pray and and, and confess to Christ that Christ, I I am broken, I I am hopeless without you, but I want to trust in you today, you can do that right now. You can do that right now. So if you would be in a spirit of prayer with me, we'll go ahead and pray, and then we will Uh, continue on, but if you would pray with me, I want to invite you, if you're here and you don't know Christ, you don't know Jesus, you don't know that you have a home in heaven, I want to invite you to pray and believe in Jesus by faith, to believe the gospel, which is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus for you, this good news. We can accept Christ through a prayer. It's not a magical prayer. It's a reflection of what we already believe in our hearts. And the Bible teaches us that a sincere prayer from a heart will be received by Jesus and we will be born again into God's forever family. We'll be uh, made right with God. And if you'd like to pray this morning, your prayer might sound something like this. Dear Jesus, I realize that I am a sinner. I know that I'm in need of your forgiveness. I believe in you, that you are my God that came to this earth. You died on the cross in my place. Three days later, you rose again from the dead, and I'm placing all my hope in you and what you did for me to rescue me from my sin, to make a relationship with you possible, and it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Heavenly Father, I just want to ask again if there's those that are here or watching and they don't know you uh, as their God, they don't know that they're on their way to heaven, Lord, I pray that you would help them make that decision today, that beautiful, wonderful decision to become part of your family. And uh, Lord, I just also pray for those that they have trusted in Christ. And Lord, there's some tests in their life. There's some things, impossible things that they're struggling with. Lord, help us to have the confidence in you that you will provide. Help us to listen to your spirit. Help us to look to to you, to look to your words. Uh, And so Lord, this week, we just want to proclaim our faith and trust in you and help us to take those steadfast steps Uh, this week. We say these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
We have a Bible study on Tuesday at Grove Place, uh, 11 uh, till late at dark. Bible study and prayer meeting, and we continue in the Gospel of John. So if you have any prayer requests, let us know. Again, welcome. Uh, this coming Saturday, John, we're going to have fantastic weather, and we're going to get the tent out, and we're going to be in uh, Steel Hall Square. Um, again, we'd love everybody to come to that and help us, but if you can't make it, please uh, do pray. Uh, that's fine. We'll just go out with the sheets and uh, give out some resources. And we'll have some uh, great uh, food from Sophia. Uh, again, we'll have. Next week is Easter. Uh, please be in prayer for that. Please uh, think about maybe even someone who you could invite. Uh, and also, if you can share it online, you'll see our Facebook stuff. If you can share it, uh, please share that. Let's uh, get a, a great uh, time of fellowship next week. It will be a great time, and it will be an Easter egg for everybody in here. Maybe a small one, <laughs> not, not a big one for everyone. Uh, so please, uh, it'll be a great time, lots of chocolate. Uh, we'll have lots of plenty of chocolate and lots of beverages, uh, of course. Uh, so, and then we have, uh, coming up the 7th of April, uh, we have our grounded uh, discipleship course. It starts, uh, it's, gonna, it's, a, it's a way just to ground in your faith, feel a little bit, perhaps maybe on a Sunday night, but the whole thing is just... Uh, Five sessions of seven, so that's sort of a way that if you're interested in just September, uh, you can do that. So that's every Sunday night, uh, starting on the seventh of April. There's a sign-up sheet down at the back as well. And then the Sunday Bible study uh, is open consistently, sort of once a month now. Uh, it's Friday at the twelfth of April, and it's being held somewhere, and uh, there'll be a certificate of profit on that. And then in a couple of Sundays from now, quite a few actually, three or four, we have Pastor Oriel Gorman, who's mentioned earlier on. He's going to come up and do some evangelism training, um, and we're also going to have a barbecue. Hopefully, uh, it'll be it'll be good weather, but the barbecue will be inside. So that's on Saturday. Which is, no, that's Friday, April the nineteenth. Yes, uh, Friday the nineteenth. Uh, that's on the Friday. That's at um, seven p.m. So there'll be some training, but we're also going to have a great time of barbecue and just uh, relax. And that's normally it's just that with men, but everyone who wants to uh, just let us know if you're coming, that would be helpful. And then on Saturday, we're going to go, try and go out and, and uh, try that evangelism uh, on the street there. And again, going to just let us know. And then finally, uh, Oriel will be speaking that Sunday as well. So that's a lot of uh, things to, to look forward to. And we're going to stand and just sing. Uh, we'll just sing one. There is a short passage to sing that, and then uh, would you please close us in a word of prayer?